everyone welcome back to travel explore celebrate life with vina world now last week we spoke to summer and we discussed sydney and new south wales today both of us sunila and i are back and we are going to talk about a land that is often known as the land of the rising sun that is japan now in the 100 episodes that we have done on travel explore celebrate life it's quite surprising that as much as we like japan we have never sat down to actually do a full fledged episode on japan and we may have spoken about japan or japanese culture history and food in many episodes over the course of the last 100 episodes but today we decided to sit down about japan now maybe many of you know that i really love japan since 2016 i've been there every year barring the pandemic years and so we decided that we are going to make this episode more so sunila asking me questions but also sharing her experience about japan because she's also been there a couple of times so sunila welcome to travel explore celebrate life we missed you last week when i was talking to summer but let's get going hi neil hi everyone yes it's good to be back and we are speaking of one of neil's favorite destinations japan <laughs> and like he's mentioned i think he's been there every time uh, you know for the last so many years except the pandemic and if you give him a chance i think he'll take the next flight to japan even right now and so will i because it's just amazing and neil i think you know usually when we start speaking uh, of a destination we speak of things to do where to go and all of that Now, of course a lot of our listeners already know that so let's change things a bit and i think this time we can start with what to eat there because that is often either people love to go to japan and enjoy the japanese food or they often worry uh, about what kind of food they'll get there so i think let's let's start with the food you know um i know you have a lot list when you go and uh, I, you know neil's the one who introduced me to a lot of the japanese items and every time we had to go somewhere in mumbai also for a restaurant the first thing that comes up is let's have a list of the japanese restaurants even in india in mumbai and mm-hmm. we often go there for a meal when it's uh, it's the entire family together as well so yes we love japan and we love japanese food so neil let's let's come to the food what's your favorite what should someone <laughs> try what are the lists see when you think about japanese cuisine i often like to term it as very unique it's mm-hmm. delicious at the same time it's very unique but often people have a misconception or people have multiple misconceptions one is people think that japanese food is only sushi noodles ramen tempura mm-hmm. but that is much more than that we'll get into that another misconception that people have is that if i'm vegetarian i will not enjoy japan because we often have grown up knowing that okay japanese food is a lot about the seafood or a lot about the meat because you've heard of the kobe beef and all of that right so mm-hmm. i often like to tell people that japanese food is more than that so if you are to like if i were to just lay down a list of things that people should eat in japan i mm-hmm. have like a 30 item bucket list that i have which i often like to tick off mm-hmm. and if i were to just right. list them down and this might get a little annoying but if i were to just list them down these 30 items are sushi udon tofu tempura yakitori sashimi ramen donburi something called natto there's something called oden then there is another thing that is known as the tamagoyaki then we come to the noodles that is the soba then that i mentioned the ramen but there is mm-hmm. along with the ramen there's udon sorry udon then there is also tonkatsu which is tonkatsu ramen that we have then there's mm-hmm. something called kashi pan then there's the sukiyaki then often you get this and often people when they go to japanese restaurants they think it is a starter but often mm-hmm. miso soup can be a meal in itself so miso soup is also on my list then there is a fun potato pancake which is often known as the okonomiyaki that is there and the then, takoyaki is right the yes the takoyaki yes yeah, takoyaki sorry yeah, yeah the takoyaki the takoyaki <laughs> i love them yeah then there's curry rice which mm. is japanese curry on rice i'm going to talk about that also there's something called shabu shabu hot pot which my brother raj really likes and whenever mm-hmm. you go meet him he'll often take you for that then there's something that all of us know gyoza which is the dumplings then adding to that adding to the soba there is something called yaki soba then there's also the checklist a small item but i often have it on my checklist is the edamame then there yes. is something called the kaiseki ryori which is more of a traditional meal then there is something known as the unagi which is the eel on rice then there is wagashi and then there is something known as the chawanmushi now we won't go, go into all of these things but this is one list that i have often kept updating and if you noticed there 
isn't much which is on the sweeter side over here because i thought when we are doing this episode mm. we'd rather keep the sweeter side for the end of the episode which was, because dessert often comes last but sometimes japan is a place where you might just wake up one day and be like okay there are so many desserts over here mm-hmm. i'm just going to have dessert so i decided not to have desserts at the start of the episode we'll keep it um, towards the last but before i dive into each of them what is your go to dish when you go to a japanese restaurant what are some of the things that you like you know even without looking at a menu you'll be like okay i'm going to order this i really like the ramen meal i i enjoy ramen the soup and the noodles together that's it for me and uh, like i said uh, the last time i went to japan um, initially you know the thing is you have a little bit of a reservation because we are not used to the meat or the seafood that you see there right i mean growing up in india everything is cooked everything is uh, is pretty much fish or chicken or maybe <laughs> lamb and that's it that's where we end with our exploration of the non vegetarian items or even the vegetarian stuff right like yeah. sea kelp and other things that often you don't get it here so i feel that whenever you're going to a new country and especially japan it takes that little bit uh, initially to overcome that thing that shall i try this and when i saw the takoyaki being sold on the streets as well and <laughs> we just picked it up from one of they look so so interesting and i loved it and everywhere we went then we would keep looking for it and i it helped me overcome this thing that uh, to try something new yeah. so that's uh, another thing i enjoy and of course tempura because there's a lot of vegetarian items in tempura as well that you can uh, have and i thought it's nice when you're sharing a meal with vegetarians to also order some common dishes by the way you know i did this episode on uh, portugal in travel kata marathi uh, podcast and do you know that the tempura came to japan from portugal oh really yes. because i so, thought that japanese cuisine had influenced a lot of the western cuisine but i didn't know this other way so around. apparently the portuguese were really good at taking their you know their style of cooking and the items everywhere and uh, in fact a lot of the items in our vada pav also come from portugal and oh, yeah, from because, south america yeah. so it's not really india's vada pav so similarly the portuguese when the, you know when they went into japan they took the art of frying salted fish in batter and that's how the tempura was born in japan so the tempura actually oh. japanese have portuguese to thank them for for that but uh, yeah so so you know you mentioned the takoyaki right mm-hmm. and um for our listeners listeners takoyaki is a delicacy that is sold on the streets of japan generally another word for it is octopus balls or octopus dumplings where it is cooked in a batter and there's like small pieces of octopus that you can have in that and i think one problem sunila we face about the takoyaki is that they are sold in batches of 6 8 or yes. 10 and if you are alone having yeah. six of the takoyaki yeah. or six of the octopus dumplings is a mm. little too heavy and they are brushed with this savory or sweet takoyaki sauce yeah. and then they are topped with mayonnaise and seaweed and all of those fish flakes and everything so i i'm glad that you mentioned takoyaki because not many people really talk about the takoyaki um dumplings or the octopus dumplings as much now another question i have because you mentioned tempura is that tempura is deep fried right mm-hmm. tempura is deep fried and it is not like our um onion bhaji kanda bhaji yeah, or potato yeah, yeah, bhaji yeah. right it's a very Temp- thin tempura is very yeah. thin so the yeah. art is in like dipping it the vegetable or the seafood and yeah. putting it back uh, into the uh, deep fryer and then getting it out yeah. sometimes people find it bland because you yes. have the tempura sauce you yeah. have tempura and you have steamed rice you don't have any curry yeah. and japan yeah. has like japan won't have japanese restaurants in tokyo mm. japan will have tempura right. restaurants japan yeah. will have sushi restaurants and they don't like to mix all of these things mm. so one thing for the listeners um would be that if you're going to japan don't think that you're going to get curry also at a tempura restaurant that's very mm. rare so be prepared that you might find it a little bland I think that's really interesting Neil but what I did notice is that when you have it really hot uh, you don't really miss any sauces and they often give you those 
little dips and you know the side dishes so if you have it all together i don't think it's that plan it's it really depends on if you're just going to have the tempura probably that's how we eat it in india but uh, in japan when you go in and mix it all together it uh, really doesn't become that bland another thing i found really interesting when i was in tokyo was that the number of vending machines they have and the you know even for food like it was amazing to see that and you can order by looking at pictures so like yeah. you can put in coins and you can actually because sometimes you don't know the names and a lot of it is written in japanese though i think a lot yeah. is now in english as well but it still doesn't make sense but when you look at the photo then you know exactly what you're going to be served and i thought that was amazing like especially you when i was walking around shibuya and going into the smaller lanes and then ordering on the vending machines looking at pictures putting in coins and then waiting for the orders to come i mean that's so unique to japan right i hear they yeah. have vending machines for everything there sake and <laughs> everything everything is on a vending machine i mean so you know how there are dating apps now right there's bumble there's tinder yeah. there's yeah. hinge and all of these things so japan has dating vending machines oh. which means that you know <laughs> that's interesting a guy or a girl can go and put their uh-huh. um, preference and then the vending machine gives you the contact details of a person who's listed on that vending machine wow. website or something like that so speaking of vending machines yes japan is known for vending machines you're going to find them everywhere and one of the cool things is that if you're looking at a vending machine there will be the price indicated below the mm-hmm. bottle yeah below that there will be a color that color will either be a blue or a red okay which means red means you're going to get your drink hot and uh-huh. blue means you're going to get your drink cold. cold so not many people know know of this mm. so you know you often see um a nescafe um drink in a vending machine in japan mm. and you'll be like hey i don't want my coffee to be like lukewarm mm. room temperature and or cold or anything let me just go to a cafe and they have thought of it already because you yeah. can you when you go for the nescafe if it's red is going to serve you a hot, hot coffee so vending machines are great over there and another thing you have to also remember is streets in japan don't have dust bins all that much mm-hmm. so if you've seen instagram if you've seen youtube there have been reports of you know japanese spectators watching a sporting event or sporting yeah. game and then cleaning out the stadium you having plastic bags so the right. whole idea in japan is that i am not going to throw my garbage into a dustbin i'm going to actually keep it with me take it home throw it in the bin take it to my office throw it in the bin over mm-hmm. there that's why you'll probably go into a cafe and you'll be like okay i'm going to take take away coffee you're walking the street suddenly you finish the coffee and you're walking and walking and walking and suddenly you just don't have there's anything no yeah mm-hmm. there's no bin and mm. that can also vending machines is one dustbins also are very unique and um i'll say are another but speaking of <laughs> food still sunida um what is the sushi that you generally go for what sushi have you had what sushi have you not had i don't even want to say it because uh, i order the easiest thing that i see and i'm not uh, you know it's it's nothing i don't really get because i like all kinds of sushi so um i i actually do enjoy the ones with the little um, you know the soft shell crab which is there in it so those are also the kinds of enjoy but every sushi and any sushi is great for me neil i don't really have a preference i i think the best part about the sushi really is for it to be fresh and uh, for the ingredients to be fresh so if i see something that's very popular then i'll just go for that because i know that that is the kind of sushi that is um, uh, being replaced and whatever you get is fresh so yeah. i'm i'm really cool with anything that comes what about you so another thing you have to remember is that when you're in japan the sushi that you get is going to be very different to the sushi you get in mumbai here mm-hmm. you have avocado cream cheese sushi you yeah. can get it there yeah here you have something known as the soft shell crab tossed yeah. with all of that sauce you know how it sauce. comes decorated yeah. and all yeah. of that you're not going to get a lot of mm. that there the sushi is a very simple item over there right it's rice and mm. it's a piece of fish or prawn or vegetables and all of that so if you recall i said that there is a misconception that vegetarians find it difficult in japan now right. my wife hatta is a vegetarian we did a trip um in february to japan with her 
my parents, her parents. And it was fairly easy for them. Because Japanese food, as much as it is concentrating on a lot of seafood and meat, a lot of it is going to be veggie friendly. So mm -hmm. you might get some places that will serve you sushi. But if someone goes there thinking, I'm going to get my avocado cream cheese sushi, I'm going to get my vegetarian mm -hmm. California roll sushi, mm -hmm. you won't find happen. those restaurants there. But for vegetarians, other items do exist. Tempura mm -hmm. restaurants will have vegetarian uh, tempura. Um, there will be many noodle restaurants that will have many um, places. But one thing you should always keep in mind that there is a chain called Coco Ichibanya. Coco mm -hmm. Ichibanya, which is a Japanese curry house. You can call it the McDonald's of Japanese curry. You'll find it everywhere. You pick your rice. You pick the ingredients that you want in your curry. Can be veg, non-veg. You okay. pick the spice level. You pick the pickles that you want everything and it comes to you and it comes instantly and over the 10 days that we were in japan we had a number of things but heta's parents were like this was the best meal we've had because japanese curry in many ways <coughs> is similar to indian curry. indian curry and then you then get that you know bland taste no gravy mm. and all of that. Japanese curry gives you that gravy. And that's why curry rice is something that people really like. You know, I often food. wonder if they're influenced by India in any way. Because you remember we spoke about this once. And uh, when I was researching, I saw that most of the Thai curries actually were Indian food that went there. And then they used the local ingredients. And they uh, then that's how Thai cuisine came into being. So most of the Thai curries are actually an extension of Indian food. So I'm not sure if Japan has anything <laughs> to do with India. So... The curry was introduced to Japan by the British during the Meiji era, which is like 1868 to 1912. Now, it slightly differs to, from Indian varieties um, yeah. is that it is more generally sweeter in flavor, mm -hmm. thicker in texture and prepared more like a stew instead of like, you know, how we prepare our curry. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> there is a hint of like a lot of these things came in from different places, right? Because after yeah. the world wars, or during the world wars, like many people were going left, right and center. So that is often like that is a very homely meal that you'll have that is Japanese right. curry. So it is Neil, and you know, yeah. I'm just going to interrupt you here because we're talking of food and we spoke of street food as well. And you spoke about going with, uh, you know, Heta and Heta's parents who are also vegetarians. And I've had the same feedback that now you do get a lot of vegetarian food. But did you, you know, I know you love going to the Michelin star restaurants as well and having that special meal. So a question that I think is on everyone's minds is, is it really worth the hype? Is it really uh, worth spending that much how early do you book because I know these restaurants get booked off pretty early right and I think is it really worth for a vegetarian is always a question I am faced you know with when you choose a Michelin star so you what know, happens I, in Japan you know I would rephrase that question is it really worth it for anyone not only vegetarians mm -hmm. because I've eaten at three of these such restaurants great experience okay but you know how when you're going to a place you are often asking a friend of yours who's already been there, hey, do you have a list of restaurants that you would recommend? Hey, you would you have something that you would recommend? My suggestion is that when you go to Japan and, you know, at Vina World, we have our customized holidays division mm -hmm. that offers the service that, you know, we can help you book many restaurants and all, wherever is possible. If someone calls us for Japan, I'm often like, why do you want to go to a Michelin star restaurant? Are you being touristy or do you really know about your food? If you're being touristy, mm -hmm. then I often tell them that why do you want to go spend 25,000 rupees on a meal? Mm -hmm. Just walk into, in, mm -hmm. like, take a list of the things that you want to eat in Japan, not the places you want to eat at, and walk into any place and you're going to love it. Like, hardly in all of these trips to Japan, hardly have I had a bad experience. And I say that with conviction because the few bad experiences that I've had in Japan have been that, okay, like, you know, I've been eating Jap Japanese food for the last eight days. Let's um, not have Japanese food, but let's go have Thai food. That was not a great experience. But certain cuisines are great in Japan as compared to their own countries, also like Italian. Many say that Italian food is better in Japan than in Italy. So um, I would say the Michelin star restaurants are a hit and a miss. I mentioned one more item on my list, which was the kaiseki. Kaiseki mm -hmm. is traditional Japanese cuisine, which will give you, a, again, a set course meal, 
but the first item is steamed second one is fried third one is boiled fourth one is like you know blue torched or something fifth one is something and the kaiseki system is such that it is designed in a way that chefs can then steam anything as part of that second course but they can't move away from it they can't bring the boiled one into the second course and move the steamed mm. one into the third course pan fried could be a course etc etc but kaiseki is a traditional meal which should follow that process now you could go to a michelin star restaurant for a kaiseki meal but if you don't know this process you don't know much about it you'll be like okay like i'm not understanding this process and most of these michelin star restaurants will have chefs who can't speak english which means you don't know what you're like what how to converse with the chef it's all about how the chef um chops the vegetables cuts the seafood the slices and all of that so and there are many restaurants like there is sushi saito in tokyo which is often known as the best sushi restaurant in the world not zero dreams of sushi because sukiyabashi zero is in ginza under um like in the metro station and we have seen documentaries of that on youtube but sushi saito has only 8 or 12 seats they say and it's mm. very hard to get in so there are some restaurants have members only which means outsiders can't come in and how do you become a member only when one of the member dies Oh, so wow. okay. <laughs> yeah so <laughs> it's morbid. yeah it's like it, it took like a very morbid turn but yeah like it's so michelin star restaurants as much as they are great my suggestion would be that figure out what are the things you want to eat tick them off by just like google mapping mm. places and going out so that's why like on our tours also we are trying to involve more of the local food mm. so that people can enjoy a lot of these things similarly if you're going by your, with your friends and family as part of customized holidays you can book it but i would say don't stick to it because in that 25 mm. 30000 that you will spend on a michelin star meal you might get three four great meals and of the three michelin star meals that i've had one was not so great like it oh, was not okay. a great experience because I'll not blame the restaurant, but I was just like, I don't understand Kaiseki food, which was that meal. One was a sushi meal I had, and one was a tempura meal. The Kaiseki food, I didn't understand it, and that's why I didn't have a great experience. So I, I hope I answered that. Yeah, question I think I think here. we can say that you know, if you're really celebrating something very special, and if it's something that is a must on your bucket list to tick off, then yes, go and have it there. but otherwise uh, there's enough good food uh, in japan to keep you like satisfied all throughout i think neil you've given a lot of food for thought and we can um, you know just plan an entire holiday revolving around food but let's let's move on from food now and uh, one of the other things that often people ask is when should i go because if you think of it maybe i have time now the japanese visa is relatively quite simple uh, to to get in it's not so much of a problem so you you don't have to decide like 6 months in advance but it's great and i know that for certain times of the year like the cherry blossoms everyone keeps talking of that you have to plan early because everything just gets uh, you know booked way in advance but there are a lot of seasons and what i've seen is japan is really turning into a year round destination so you know like how we back home and in kashmir we used to say that it is a land of four seasons you experience spring summer autumn and winter would you say the same about japan because you have been there so many times and you've actually been skiing in japan as well so you've seen yeah. the changes you've seen different things i've experienced the autumn colors in korea and i know that south korea and japan the autumn colors are pretty similar and they're just stunning like they yeah. are just so beautiful so what's what's your take on it should can someone go like four times a year or what's the best time should you avoid crowds what do you do see everyone has this notion that or if you ask anyone and if you ask anyone in the industry also they be like when should i go to japan they be like cherry blossom cherry blossom mm-hmm. mein jana chahiye and mm-hmm. i'm saying that okay cherry blossom is one period where japan is beautiful but at the same time there is another period called the autumn colors or the fall colors mm-hmm. which generally speaking can be between september to october if you're in the north of japan and can be october to november if you're in central japan and as you move to the southern parts of japan that can be like the autumn foliage could be anywhere um towards like you know november and december november yeah so autumn colors are another season that you can really think about going to japan now the the weather in japan 
can be up down like you know right now as we speak june and july can be rainy season my brother raj and i went to japan once and we actually uh, caught the rains every day the only day we didn't catch the rains was the mount fuji day we'll speak about that in a bit but may june july or may june july actually are the rainiest okay mm. but rain is not like how we, the rain that we are seeing right now like pouring 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 like soft rain gradual rain is when you'll see it then you move on to august september october november and i feel that even better than cherry blossom the autumn colors are a time that you should definitely go to japan many of my friends are actually going in november and december and i've like planned out um, the entire thing for them just because the weather's nice you're mm-hmm. setting into winter that's what autumn is right now uh, you're setting into yeah. winter you have all of these leaves on those oh, they trees. look beautiful they look beautiful Just you can stunning. go into parks in tokyo yeah. parks in kyoto when you when you're going to mount fuji you'll see a lot of those things so october november is the peak day time mm. when you can certainly go another thing is that these two seasons are not the only times that you should go to japan because you then know that there there is more tourist flow coming in in these two places which yeah. means you're going to have to wait in lines for trains sightseeing places if you're going to team lab planet um the artwork museum in tokyo um you have to wait in line for that you will be waiting in line for restaurants in such a way that you know you're waiting and in line for so two hours yeah they are so patient when they wait in line exactly. japanese yeah. we are not we are yeah. not. so barring that i feel people should definitely visit in the winters because in the winters it's cold but mm. it looks beautiful some parts of japan will have the snow and like all of the cities in japan look beautiful during that um you when the snows on the arashiyama bamboo grove in kyoto yes. it looks beautiful so that is also a great period to visit then the months of may june july and august are the best because you will be able to click photos without people in your frame and that means it's less crowds and often we say that less crowds means that you get more me time on your holiday so japan overall i would say is a year round destination but i want i like i try to even tell people that you know it's not only that the months of february march april are the months that you know you should actually visit japan why not visit it towards the end of the year because the autumn yeah. colors and if anyone who's listening if you just google autumn colors japan you will see photos that are incredible and photos that you would want on your instagram or facebook profile like i would definitely say that yeah neil and you mentioned you know it's really interesting how um, like for example the autumn colors in canada probably the peak just stays for two weeks in the east of canada towards toronto montreal so you really have to time it well what i i love about visiting the autumn colors in japan is starting from hokkaido sapporo and then coming down to tokyo to tokyo you know and moving down to kansai or even up to nagasaki you can actually you have a wide range of the months to experience that and there are so many things to do in the country and um, you know in the different places so we'll speak about them of course but um uh, you mentioned kyoto and we'll talk about that but before we go to kyoto one of the most iconic images of japan is mount fuji and uh, you know the people of japan for them it's almost a very revered uh, figure it's like i think they they treat it like their mother right like it's yeah. almost godly and uh, so let's let's talk about mount fuji because do you just see it from far can you go up you know is it because every time you land and we are all trying to see that can we see mount fuji is it covered in cloud because a lot of times the cloud cover is there on mount fuji so if you are really lucky you can see the exact shape and it is an image you don't want to forget i i remember being there and it was quite cold we were it was very cold in fact like you mentioned but we were dressed pretty warm and uh, we happened to be on a site where everything else was golden and then we just saw mount fuji and i think the entire trip seemed worth it so mount fuji really has a special place i know it's a unesco protected site um and very important in the japanese culture so let's talk about mount fuji so they often call mount fuji fuji san mm-hmm. and you can do a day trip to mount fuji from tokyo you can go to mount fuji and stay in hakone you can do multiple things but mount fuji why is it so famous because 
when you look at pictures of mount fuji there is this one mountain which is just towering over just flat mm. land all around it and that is why the japanese people really worship it it is um it is actually surrounded by five lakes so they are known as the five lakes of mount fuji one is lake motosu second one is lake shojin lake sai lake kawaguchi and the fourth one oh sorry the fifth one is the lake yamanaka now these five lakes surround mount fuji and um when you are in mount fuji and if you are staying there people often tell you about the history of the lakes of mount fuji the different things that mount fuji really symbolizes and often in japan mount fuji is seen as a bringer of good luck now can you climb mount fuji yes you can climb mount fuji there are actually four different trails to the summit of mount fuji and the mm-hmm. actual crater is known to have like um eight peaks but we'll not get into that but more so you have to know that mount fuji is made up of three active volcanoes it's a it's mm-hmm. part of a national park which is known as the Fu- fuji hakone izu national park and mm-hmm. um there is climbing season which lasts for two months and this it is during this time of the year where people can actually go uh, and climb mount fuji now of course it has been a symbol to many japanese people but oh. when you do go to mount fuji you go to something known as the fifth station of mount fuji where a car can drive up to and from like imagine being on the mountain and then still being able to look up and see oh. like tr- see the top of the mountain now whenever you're going you have to remember that mount fuji is often shy and that's what the guide will also tell you oh. that mount the mount like mount fuji may or may not be seen yeah. may not be seen because there could be cloud cover there could be just overcast conditions and you may not be able to see the entire thing and it's a matter of luck but just going mm-hmm. there knowing that it holds such an important place um in the japanese culture is what really makes mount fuji what it is now the waters of all of these five lakes like cradle the northern base of mount fuji and it's often like you know if you want to really explore rustic japan it is said that you know you should go and stay at one of the properties mm-hmm. that are surrounding mm-hmm. it and of course you're paying a premium for a fuji view if you're going to mount fuji you will also go to a place called hakone and over there like i mentioned the fuji hakone izu national park uh you'll see scenic beauty you'll have a lot of relaxing places and you know japan often has those story gates right those orange yes, colored gates they, that you see look so, so pretty, there yeah. is a small cruise that you can do and i've done that a couple of times where it is known as the lake ashi uh, cruise and mm-hmm. you just hop on to like this olden era boat and it takes you um, across the lake and you see a lot of these um story gates that are there uh, all all surrounding surrounding the lake so mount fuji is fun mount fuji is great viewing it is great you can go see it from different viewing spots all across and when you do that day trip from from mount fuji or if you're doing a a trip where you're going to mount fuji staying in hakone and then leaving the next day you are going to have a sublime spiritual experience i think and you know heta heta would keep asking me that okay why are you so fixated with mount fuji like you know mm-hmm. what's up and i don't know like ever since i've been to japan even the first two trips when i didn't go to mount fuji i was like okay like you know um there is something in tokyo that yeah. also like people keep talking about mount fuji keep calling it fuji san and that's why like a trip there is definitely mm-hmm. or should definitely be on your cards if you have many days spend two or three days there you can see mount fuji from different angles and like on a clear day it looks beautiful so i think um yeah. that's a bit about mount fuji so that's really nicely put neil because i like how you call it a very sublime experience and a spiritual experience and the very thought that the japanese people are giving it so much respect by calling it fuji san it makes it um, more pers- you know as if it's personified in a way it's not just a mountain but there's so much more about it and uh, you can talk of that so neil one of the places that i've been dying to go back to because i felt like I really didn't get enough time there 
is uh, is Kyoto, which was of course the old capital of Japan. And just walking on the streets of Kyoto, like I want to go there and just walk those old streets, the small streets out there. Because on the one hand, you have these Buddhist temples, you have gardens, you have imperial palaces, even Shintoism, like a lot of the Shinto shrines are there. And Shintoism is so um, ingrained in the Japanese uh, culture because, you know, praying to nature is something that um, that is very close. And actually, it also goes with Hinduism, right? We also personify and pray to rivers and mountains and everything. So with all of that, and you mentioned the Kaiseki dining, it's known for that. It's also known for the geishas. And a Along with that, uh, in Kyoto, you can stay in a lot of the more uh, traditional homes as well, right? You can experience that as well. So Kyoto is something which is quite fascinating. And I think the next time I go, I'm really going to keep more time for that. Um, it's also where I tasted my first matcha ice cream. So uh, it, for me, it is really quite special. So what's your take on Kyoto? And See, it's funny how Kyoto, Tokyo, the names are like the same. Yeah, they are like, actually. Uh -huh. So, yeah, but very different in, in, in their whole being and culture, right? Yeah. So, see, if you're going from Tokyo, you'll do Fuji. And from Fuji, you'll hop onto the bullet train and you'll come to Kyoto. Mm -hmm. And once in, you're in Kyoto, this was a few years ago when we were doing our tour manager trainings at Vina World, which keep happening right. at the corporate office all the time. We came up with this concept. That when you're going to Kyoto, think about four things. Mm -hmm. Think about your four sensory things. One okay. is smell, one yeah. is taste, one is the feel, and one is what you hear. Right? Okay. And if you look at Kyoto, let's start with what you hear. Mm -hmm. You hear the bustling crowds at a market, which is the Nishiki market, which okay. is like the seafood market. You go yeah. there, you can try any seafood, raw, mm -hmm. sometimes cooked and all of that. For seafood lovers, you can enjoy that. Mm -hmm. Then you mentioned the geishas and all of that. Um, so again, about hearing, you hear traditional music, like traditional music mm. at something known as the Gion Kono, mm. where you know you'll have all of this traditional music going on in the evenings, and you'll mm. see um, these Japanese geishas dressed in their attire. And of course, what is a geisha? We'll cover the next time. So um, mm. you can hear that. So when you're in Kyoto, you have to keep your uh, ears like you know looking out for these bustling crowds at Nishiki market or the traditional mm. music at Gion Kono. Second thing let's talk about smell like Kyoto is about smell where you smell greenery at the Kyoto mm. Botanical Garden you'll smell greenery there are these fresh tea leaves that are the Kyoto tea ceremony that you can do where you mm. can actually enjoy Japanese tea that is an experience that you can certainly do and the third one that you can smell are the sakura, which is the cherry blossoms, right? Mm -hmm. On something known as the philosopher's mm -hmm. path. And of course, you see them everywhere, but you smell them, you see them. And that's what you really can enjoy in Tokyo. Then the third sensory thing is feel. You feel peaceful. Like you go to any of the temples in Kyoto, you feel peaceful. If you go to the um, Kamagawa, sorry, Kamogawa River, you mm -hmm. feel relaxed. You go to the Ara, like Arashiyama bamboo grove, which is like these crazy green mm. bamboos. And if you Google it or you check on Instagram, you will find this Arashiyama bamboo grove. You're just amazed at how it is. So this is what you feel. And finally, the fourth thing, the fourth sensory thing is taste. Mm. Now, what is uh, Kyoto known for? Kyoto is known for okonomiyaki. I mentioned it, but I didn't talk about it. It's like this pancake sort of thing, which you can have vegetarian or non-vegetarian. And you'll find many okonomiyaki places. For vegetarian lovers, you will also find tofu. Now, tofu, we often think is like just another ingredient because it's like a vegetarian alternative or something like that. But tofu, especially silicon tofu, is enjoyed by everyone in Kyoto. And this is made like, you know, it's often deep fried. Sometimes like it's cooked in such a way where the outer thing is crispy, inner thing is like that silky thing and all of those things. So you'll enjoy or you'll see a lot of... Um, the tofu over there. Then there is also the shochu, which is a drink that you can have. So you get these four sensory things and that's how you really get to enjoy Kyoto. Now, what is there to do in Kyoto? Like I mentioned, and I think I mentioned using these four yeah. sensory things, I mentioned everything. But Nishiki Market, Arashiyama Bamboo Grove, there is the Fushimi Inari Shrine, which is mm. probably one of the best um, shrines that I've been to. And you can actually climb the Tori Gates 
and go up that small hill that is there. It is a two or three kilometer hike, which you can do. Mm -hmm. And you know, often you see these orange colored gates, which we spoke of at uh, Lake Ashi or in Hakone that you will see. But at Fushimi in Arishain, you will see thousands of these gates. So often people are like, I saw a gate, I'm clicking a photo, clicking a photo. Mm -hmm. But if you go to Fushimi in Arishain, you'll be like, okay, like I've seen thousand gate gates now. Gate, I you know, it's like yeah. when we went to when we went to Antarctica, yeah. and uh, the yeah. first time you see penguins, everyone's like, You're "Oh my so god, excited. go go for yeah. penguins, penguins, penguins!" By day four, everyone's like, "Okay, another penguin. Oh, mm. a penguin jumped in the water. Great!" <laughs> like you, you know, so yeah, exactly. The, you know, so it's it's like that. Penguins, so yeah. I guess that's a little bit about Kyoto, where you know <laughs> you have multiple things. There's also like one of like there's a Starbucks in like this 150 year old like mansion and it's often known yeah. as a bucket list item and the Starbucks in Kyo Tokyo Kyoto Japan anywhere will give you matcha teas and all of that oh. and matcha teas are something that you know many people like I'm not a huge fan but people love it and yeah. I think that's something that you can really really um try by going to that Starbucks or any other I coffee think shop. you should try it at least once and then decide if you like it or not if you don't try it you never know you know maybe you're missing out on some taste some people find it very tasteless and it's uh it's not my favorite though yeah. I didn't enjoy the matcha ice cream I must say at least the one I had was really good but Neil I <laughs> knew I knew that when we would start this episode today that we would go on and on and on and before we know it um you know we'll be speaking about it we haven't even touched on a lot of the other things but there is just so much about Japan which is just uh, so interesting and so stunning like you mentioned the food and just the quality and the quality that goes into everything you know be it the yeah. electronics be it the cars um, so much of culture like the sumos the samurais even the the concepts and the books we read right from ikigai to ichigo ichi to so many things and the destinations I mean we all know Hiroshima and Nagasaki and all of that we mentioned Mount Fuji Kyoto, Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, Hakone, the list is just endless, Sapporo. Um, is there anything else you want to touch upon today? Because uh, I guess we can always do a follow-up episode on Japan always because there's always so much to speak. But, you know, what 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 else do you want to speak about today on Japan? See, if you, if you really recall, we spoke about food, but we didn't talk about Tokyo. And that's because mm -hmm. an episode on Tokyo or multiple episodes on Tokyo can be done yeah. because they say that I think one fifth of the population of Japan actually just stays in Tokyo. Yeah. They say 40, I think about 35,000 restaurants in India, Tokyo has 75,000. Mm. So we haven't spoken about Tokyo and we are not going to cover it on this episode, but this episode I would say was more just like um, an introduction to Japan, Japan I would say or yeah. our thoughts our conversation on Japan I would like to end it with desserts but before that if you want to cover something like tell me no I think that is just so much I mean from onsens to other things is there you know the, the one thing I would like to speak to before we move ahead is for people who actually have tattoos and they're visiting Japan. Oh, yes. Is there a precaution they should take? Because I, I mean, mentioned nonsense simple. and I remembered <laughs> our conversation. So I, a lot of us have, you know, people do have yeah. tattoos on their body. And they often, they are shocked when they go to Japan that they probably don't get the service they expect. So one note about that and then we will move on to desserts and wrap it up. So, you know, we did an episode on our other podcast, Know the Unknown, on the history and significance of mm -hmm. tattoos. So tattoos used to be like... um on the bodies of samurai soldiers but right. later on the japanese mafia the yakuza started having tattoos and the japanese people frown upon people who have tattoos because it reminds them of the yakuza so if you have some if you are someone who has tattoos on their bodies japan is not going to be overly friendly to you you have to remember that mm. if you have a massive tattoo like all over your body which is you quite can't visible yeah. it's which is quite visible you can't enter a nonsen and mm -hmm. an onsen is, of course, that hot bath that you can do in yeah. Japan, which is amazing. And you have to remember that there are male onsens and female onsens. And you can't go in your swimming costume there. You have to remove all of your clothes and go yeah. into the onsen. And there are other people also. You can't have tattoos on you. Mm -hmm. Some restaurants may not allow you if you have tattoos. Huh. So <laughs> a friend yes. of mine had gone and they said that put band-aid all over your hand because you have like a tattoo like hmm. all across your hand so if you have a tattoo it is going to be uh, so 
if you like Japan, if you like Asian food, if you like Southeast Asian food, Far East Asian food, don't get a tattoo. It's a, it's as simple as that. And yeah, there are multiple, a crepe bandage yeah, and, you know, yeah. cover yourself and walk it's around. A cult- you it's do. a culture where they respect yeah, yeah. you a lot and you also have to respect them. Right. So, yeah, you have, to, you have to do that. Wow, that is really interesting. And that's why I wanted to touch upon that. And I think we can uh, we can come to the end now, Neil, and speak about the desserts. So, I know you will have a list of 50 desserts to try, but we probably don't have time for all of those. Let's just speak of the five desserts mm. that you must try. And I don't know if Roy's chocolates uh, are one of them. But uh, Namma Royce is something that Good everyone point. loves. Yeah. So, um, you know, that could be an extra. But what are your top five desserts? So my list has 36. We'll talk about See, five. I knew it. Yeah. Yes. I, ju- I was just going through the list and yeah, it's 36. But speaking of Royce chocolate, here you get it in India, it's super expensive. But when you're yeah. leaving Japan, when you're at the airport, go to the store after immigration you will find Roy's chocolate mm. and you can pick up boxes and they are quite cheap at that airport and so, you have to keep it uh refrigerated right so they actually yeah. give you a cool they, box they, they, yeah, they put it you, in right they give, they give you the dry you, bag yeah, yeah the dry bag yeah. Dry, is it? yeah okay five desserts i'll say yes. the japanese cheesecake okay. which is different to the new york cheesecake which is different to the cheesecake that you'll get in paris because this is more fluffy it's light mm-hmm. it's moist and has a delicate texture to it that's one Second one is kaki gori. Now, kaki okay. gori is shaved ice, which is similar to a gola mm. with fruit syrup or sweet flavoring. And there are hundreds of different flavors that you can find for the kaki gori. Third one is a Japanese crepe. Again, similar to what you will get, but this is more of like a crepe cone, which is filled with ice cream, fruits, or anything that you want can be sweet or savory. Mm. But a crepe um, is something. Now, I'm just confused what should I probably say next, but mochi, like, you know, mochi is something Mm, that people really like. One thing, speaking of desserts or any food, try to gauge the expression on your partner or your fellow traveler's face when they are first, like, like taking the first bite of food in Japan, because the texture is what really makes it important. Um, And that is why, like, when I was looking at Heta, we were sitting at a cafe and she bit into the first, like, mochi or something like that and she like that expression was like wow like have never tried something like this and you know i just like like that when i'm with someone my friends heta anyone they really enjoy their food i guess mochi would be four and probably five would be like something known as the taiyaki which is like a fish shaped cake with a bean filling inside and taiyaki you will find everywhere and Often when you look at a fish shaped something, vegetarians mm. will be like, Are, no, 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 I don't want this. Yeah, mm. Like, you know, mm. it's non-veg, but it's not. It's veg, but it's like a very traditional thing that you can have. So these are five that came to mind looking at the list that I have, but 31 others remain and Royce is not part of that. So there's a lot that you can do. And another thing you should also do is visit the 7-Eleven in Japan. Mm-hmm. Japan 7-Eleven is super interesting. You okay. can pick up a glass from the fridge which has strawberries already in there, raspberries, everything, put it in the machine, it creates a smoothie, automatically gives it to you. It's a robot. Um, You know, often we go and get a can of Coke, but often we want to have Coke with ice. So Japanese 7-Elevens will have just ice in a cup, like, you know, a closed cup that you can pick up on the go and put your Coke in there. Uh, you'll have a lot of the different foods that we mentioned at a 7-Eleven. So 7-Eleven in Japan is very different. It's very different to your convenience, it's your, to your any other like random convenience store. And the snacks are what you should definitely keep having in between meals because mm-hmm. they are also good. So yep, that's like Japan. And yeah, and if you keep walking, you have a nice walking tour. You can burn off... Uh all the food that we've been speaking about. I think, Neil, what's really interesting is that in Japan, when you're going, um, unlike a lot of other places, as you're doing the sightseeing and as you're doing other things, you're visiting attractions, you're taking in the country, you're really learning a lot about the culture as well. 
from simple things like food to even like a simple thing you mentioned, like going to 7-Eleven and buying a Coke, um, you, you see the whole thought process behind it and you get a insight into the culture of Japan, which I think is very, very, very unique to this country. And like you mentioned, one time is not enough. So, you know, to all our listeners there, at least if you haven't been to Japan as yet, I think it's time to make that first trip. You have the autumn and the winter season coming up. So you can start off with that. Enjoy Japan to the fullest and maybe come back there for summer or for cherry blossoms or or just for a food tour or shopping, actually, because shopping is great in Japan, too. And uh, I, I know that when Neil and family went, they actually came back with more suitcases as well, which typically happens to the U.S., but they did come back from Japan with a lot of other things. So, Neil, do you want to close the episode? Well, I would just say arigato gozaimasu, which is thank you in Japanese. Um, like Sunila said, one trip to Japan is not enough, as you have figured out through us telling you one episode on Japan is not enough. So we'll come back, yes. keep coming back with more episodes. But thank you everyone for listening. And if you're still with us, well, like, you know, write to us at Neil, N-E-I-L at the rate vinawold.com or Sunila, S-U-N-I-L-A at the rate vinawold.com and tell us what topics you would like us to take up because all of these topics are what listeners have been writing to us and we have a massive list and we're going to keep coming to you with more fun topics. Thank you for listening and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.